Okay, we have had a unanimous uh, vote and uh, approval. Michael, you are allowed to uh, participate in our meeting. <coughs> very good. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Excuse me. I made a motion. Ken seconded. made it first and Lou seconded. <clears throat> okay, so uh, <clears throat> let's uh, now do attendance. John, would you start with us, please? Uh, John Cheshire, Cork. Lou Dr. Cork. <laughs> Ken Lasseter, Cork. Roderick McCoy, Cork. Virginia Ferris, Cork. Leanne Evans, School District. Uh, David Dolan, uh, Facilities Management. David Porter, Cork. Bill Yuckel, Cork. Leah Gaines, Cork. <laughs> Patricia Morales, Office of General Counsel. Art, Facilities Construction. Frank Barbieri, School Board. Okay, uh, our guests. <clears throat> Okay, thank you everyone. Get our attendance done. <clears throat> and we voted for Michael to participate, so that gives us, Jim, I think nine, right? Or yep. ten. Does that give us ten? Uh, which mic? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You got Leah? Ten. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. All right. Um, I have no other opening announcements except now that we're meeting in person again, any cell phones on the table should be taken off the table, please, so we don't get microphone feedback. And on vibrate, if you would, so we don't get any phone call interruptions. Um, <clears throat> any changes to the agenda by anyone? All right, hearing none, none requested by staff, okay. Um, anyone with conflict of interest for anything we're going over today? All right, seeing none. Cork report. Lou, you submitted a report last month? Yes, it was submitted to the board and distributed, and they had no comments. Okay, can you do a report for us again? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much. We're down to staff updates already. Okay, uh, Jim, did you have anything you wanted to start with? Okay. A uh, couple of things I wanted to um, let everybody know about. Yes, uh, as I mentioned last month, um, this will be our last meeting uh, in person in this boardroom. Um, we are uh, doing improvements to the cork room the, down at, uh, at uh, North County Support Center, or up at North County Support Center, uh, for all sorts of good stuff, uh, cameras and audio recording and computers so we can do this thing so, um, so that Many of you who might remember me standing there holding a laptop, pointing it at people, we won't be doing that anymore. So we will have a, a much more organized uh, system. We anticipate that that will be in place by next month, which is September, I think it's 13th, is our uh, meeting. And um, so we will, um, please make sure that when you guys see the, uh, the uh, updates from Susan next month, that we are anticipating we're gonna be back at North County. Um, Staff updates. Uh, in addition to that, um, I'm going to try to gloss over the, the start of school. Uh, it's, uh, I, I never want to uh, put too much um, gloss on it, but uh, we had a really good opening yesterday. Uh, from a facility standpoint, um, things went very well. We had a good summer. It wasn't quite as long as we needed it to be, but we still got a lot of work done. And we were able to get all the schools open and operating. Um, and uh, with, to my knowledge, uh, very little disruption. There were a couple little blips, but by and large, we did a very, very strong job. And um, one of the pieces that I wanted to kind of convey to you guys as a Cork uh, uh, committee is I found out from our, our maintenance department, you know, obviously uh, our maintenance department and our construction department work, work very closely together all year long on these projects. And the work that was done over the last three years at all these schools. Remember, we, we, we set up our facility renewals as worst first kind of thing, right? So a lot of the schools, the first 50, 60 schools that we've been working on for the last three years, 
We've had a tremendous impact. And I, I, uh, I was talking to Stacey Marshall this morning and she mentioned to me, she said, don't forget, two years ago when we did opening of schools, I used 17 temporary chillers throughout the district to make sure that we had air conditioning up and working properly and doing well. This school year, we had absolutely zero temporary chillers. And again, Leanne, I, you know, I don't want to thank you too much, but Leanne's been an incredible uh, assistant in making sure that we had the money necessary, both on the facility renewal and on the, the chillers was a separate, uh, separate facility. Uh, I want to add. Yeah, go ahead. I want to add on the chillers. You know, that was such a big issue a few years ago. The, the board actually approved to do some equipment leases. So we borrowed money to pay them back over five years, and we were able to expedite all the air conditioning chiller replacements that were not included in the facility renewal program. So just about every air conditioning air conditioner in this district has been updated and replaced with 10-year warranties. There's still some that are in the works that they're working on right now to finish that program up, but um, I heard Stacy say that when we met on Monday. Yeah. And, you know, all the work that's been done over the past few years and the money spent was well worth it. And um, so there weren't air conditioning problems that I've heard of. That's correct. And that, that's the, the key point that I wanted to make out of it. It's not just the chillers, but even the air conditioning. A lot of the air handler projects and, and EMS controls that we've implemented at these facility renewals, those schools that were in, in uh, dire need, we've, we've been fortunate to be able to get there. And it really has started to show a dramatic impact that we had a very good opening. And again, I, I, gotta, I thank you all um, and as well the taxpayers of Palm Beach County for helping us get there. This was a big deal, making sure that our schools opened yeah. without any problems like that. You know, those were issues in the past. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, and you, you saw the proof of that with the CSIR report that went to the board a month or two ago. That volume is less than it's ever been, and it's because we're catching up on all the maintenance, and it does make a big difference. So, yeah, and it, that, that's basically the, uh, the extent of my comments, but I, I, like, I, I wanted to thank my staff and, and the maintenance department. Together, we've done a really strong job of making sure we stay on top of it, catching all the bad ones, you know, trying to make sure that everything's moving forward um, smoothly. Um, but uh, w w doesn't, we're not, not letting our foot off the gas. We've got a lot more work to go, too, so. Yeah, two comments. Um, did you make sure you put that espresso machine into the new upgrades that they're doing? <laughs> That's in the budget, right? Good idea. <laughs> Actually, if that was in there, I would have stopped it. I so, was going to say. <laughs> There's somebody who wouldn't have let that go through. Yeah, well, we we'll we're just, we'll just call that a speaker <laughs> or a microphone. Um, with the idea of we're catching up and we're getting repairs done, I think the diligence then needs the next step to be funding maintenance appropriately. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we do that because that's not through another referendum. Um, but somehow we need to make sure that the budget remains there because that's how we got in the hole. I mean, we weren't able to fix a roof because there were no maintenance dollars. And a lot of that goes back to the state hacking our money, but somehow we got to make that happen. Yeah, you'll be able to see some of that when we look at the capital plan. Okay. I'll actually, it wasn't planning on it, but the document is there. We can bring it up when we get to that part of the agenda. And I can show, it, it actually, it's going to be hard to see because it's in the last five years when the referendum's done. But... Um, I think I can. I think I can show you. So. Well, I think that's the time we're going to need the maintenance money anyway. We're not going to need the maintenance money right now because we're improving everything. But once those improvements are done, we have to maintain them. Right. Or we're back to another referendum ten years from now. But again, wrapping it up, I don't, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that. Yeah. Wrapping it up, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that um, we've done an incredible job. Uh, you know. I'm, not saying me, but the team has done an incredible job. And you guys as well at, at Cork, you guys, <laughs> uh, this month being the perfect testament, all the efforts that you guys had to go through on all these things. Um, it takes a lot of your time, and I am very appreciative of all the efforts that you guys uh, uh, put forward, because without it, we wouldn't be able to have be this successful. Um, you guys have uh, played along with, worked along with us all the way through. And it's been uh, greatly appreciated. Jim, go ahead. Yeah, um, this is Elkhan Reed with the mayor, and I wanted to correct what I said. We have nine members present. Yeah, Mr. Mike. Thank you. Sam, Frank, and Tom are excused. Six, seven. Sam, Frank, and Tom are excused. We have nine. Uh, and Mr. Gelfand has raised his hand. Okay, can we see Michael on the screen like we did last meeting? Am I doing this wrong? 
And Michael was up on the screen last time. We could see him speak and we could hear him speak. And there he is. Michael, you had your hand raised. Yes. Nothing better to start the morning than to see me on a big screen. I hope I don't scare too many people away. Um, I agree. It's been uh, you know, a wonderful success, and it shows uh, a tremendous amount for the staff to get these projects moving forward, especially uh, on these items that folks don't perceive. One of the questions I have, particularly dealing with air conditioning systems or HVAC moving forward, uh, is and, and maybe I am just a pessimist and a cynic, but the um, march of airborne diseases does not seem to be waning and likely it's going to increase as international travel increases and we just move a lot as, 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 uh, as society. Are we going to be changing our HVAC specification to try to deal with additional filtering issues or is someone going to be looking at this? so that, you know, let's say within six months or a year, we've got a handle as to where we're going. If, if I may, um, th uh, thank you, Mr. Gelfand. That's a, a very valid point. Um, just so everyone understands, um, the district has made a, a very um, a, a strong concerted effort to change over all air handlers in the entire district to MERV 13 which is the, as we're now dealing with CDC, is definitely the minimum standard, but every, every air handler from schools to modular classrooms has been changed out to a, a MERV 13 system. In addition to that, um, um, Lan and I are, are working with, uh, with our team on the ESSER funds. I think we have ESSER 3 funds coming out, and there are quite a, uh, there's a great deal of money involved. Um, we are going to be making recommendations uh, to the board um, in coming days. I, I don't want to sp spell out specifically when, but um, we've been working with consultants on measures both short-term and long-term to continue to upgrade the air conditioning systems, the filtration, the um, indoor air quality um, at all schools. So while I'd love to offer up a specific answer to you right now, um, Stick with us, because we certainly are going to have a presentation to the board soon with recommendations so that they understand how we intend to spend the money. There's a couple of years worth of money that we, we're going to have. In addition so, to that, I, I want to add that we have also purchased over $6 million or, uh, of uh, air purification systems that we're putting in the classrooms. Uh, that's been a project that with a really quick turnaround. And so we're, we're delivering truckloads of air purifiers uh, for the classrooms, specifically uh, ESC classrooms and clinics. So that is going on uh, as we speak. So uh, again, you know, we are very fortunate in that we do have the ESSER 3 funds to uh, help prepare this district for any future, uh, hopefully not happening or occurring, but any future pandemics. Question, um, what is ESSER 3? I lost that somewhere in my acronym list. Um, I, actually, I, I think it's really part of the American Rescue Plan that we're spending, uh, that was ESSER 3, which I believe is elementary and secondary. Um, School emergency re recovery. Um, thank you. Between the two of us, we got it. Um, it's the federal funds that are coming down to help school districts um, continue to function. Um, we had students that weren't here. We had changes that we needed to do to prepare the schools. So there's been um, ESSER 1, 2, and 3. And ESSER 3, I believe, is also part of the American Rescue Plan. Um, and that's a big chunk of money that's coming. And it's focused, it, it's focused on helping the students recover. Um, from learning losses. And there's also money that's being set aside for making changes to facilities. So how those funds will be used um, have to be presented to the board and we have to receive public input and how that big chunk of money is going to be spent. But there is money set aside for facility improvements. So I'm sure you'll hear more about that. Right now we're still structuring that and figuring out how much is spent on staffing versus um, improvements to buildings. There's a lot of different categories, and it's, it's a lot of money. Um, so I, I know Dave and his team are working on that right now. So you'll hear more about that. 
In addition, it also provides money for water fill stations mm -hmm. uh, uh, or bottle fill stations. Uh, we have incorporated those are, uh, in our new buildings. Uh, so it gives us the opportunity to also incorporate them in our uh, existing facilities. So we're pretty excited about it. Uh, we have several options that we're looking at. And again, it's just to prepare us uh, for now and going into the future. So we're very fortunate uh, to have these dollars to do these things. Do those funds flow directly to the district from federal sources or do they have to go through the MV approved by the state? They, they do go through the state, but it's not part of the FEFP calculation. It's handled as a grant. So we'll have to supply the application, which is very straightforward. The, the holdup at this point is the state has to apply for them. So I believe the state provided guidance on that um, last week. So we're getting more and more information coming from the feds and coming from the state. So um, it, doesn't, it, it does pass through Florida Department of Education, though. Uh, Mr. Barbier, sure. Barry, you wanted to... If, I, if I may. One on the water fill stations, uh, if we can find some way of tracking their use to see if those should be added to specifications for school okay. renovation construction in the future. And <clears throat> excuse me, second, I want to uh, usually I'm um, uh, somewhat negative on the school PR efforts, but uh, to the extent anyone still reads the newspapers, there's been some very good PR in the paper, including on the uh, uh, the filtering instance. So. Michael, I believe the, uh, the, the specs that are now going out for any new construction or renovation construction includes the water fountain change out to the drinking, the bottle filling stations. Yep. So that's already been covered. Yep. Okay. Mr. Barbieri, you uh, had a question? Comment? I have a comment. I, you know, I, I want to echo what Mr. Dolan. <clears throat> I just want to thank all the CORP members um, being part of these meetings for 13 years. I know what kind of work you, you all put in for us. Um, every opportunity I have at the board meetings, I thank Mrs. Paul for the great work that the building department is doing in our, in our campuses, but I don't have the opportunity to, to thank you, even though I sit at these meetings. Uh, I usually thank Mr. Doctor when he comes to our meetings and say, please tell everybody we appreciate your help. But I just want to tell you, I know you've done a tremendous amount of work for us. Um, you are instrumental, which is why I fought to get the policy change to make sure you, you all could meet because we need your advice before we vote on these issues. So I just want to thank all of you for the countless hours that you've donated uh, of your time and efforts to the district. So on behalf of the board, thank you all very much. Thank to you. Uh, segue onto that, Lou, for your report, we had 1,521 pages of documents to review for this meeting. I, I had some comments on that. Okay, Virginia. My question is back to the funding. Is this money that we already have, or are we spending our money and then getting reimbursed through the state? Once we tell them what we're spending the money on and the grant is approved, they will send, they send it to us. Um, so we're spending our money right now? The money we're spending right now is with ESSER two, and we've already drawn that down. We already have the cash, so we, we have received the cash. It's done at each individual level. When ESSER 1 came in, um, we, we actually spent it and were reimbursed. With what we're doing right now, um, we've just we've drawn that cash down. So we're spending directly from those funds. We're not having to be reimbursed. Okay, thank you. When we get to the next phase, I'm not sure how that's going to work. Each phase has been different. So we'll, we'll see what the timing looks like with those. But chances are we'll get that money in advance. Thank you. Question I've got on the new policy, I think, for advisory boards. Does that kick in at our next CORC meeting? And if so, is there a restriction that anybody has to be in person? I guess I want to make sure, you know, I know Michael's enjoyed being virtual, but is there going to be, I mean, can everybody then be virtual and we don't have a physical meeting? Okay. Go ahead, Holly. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, when the board passes uh, board policy 1.09, the revisions, it's going to allow the quorum to be made up with virtual as well as in-person members. So it's, it's going to actually give you a lot more flexibility because the people that don't want to come in for whatever reason, you don't have to vote anymore on people being allowed to attend <clears throat> um, virtually. So 
it's going to change things up because it's going to make it easier virtual and in person will count towards the quorum and then once you have a quorum um you can continue your business okay and the new room will be set up that if we have two people that want to show up at the meeting and everybody else wants to sit in their jammies at home and participate they'd be allowed to do that that is correct so i guess do we need to figure out at each meeting as it comes up how many people are going to attend in person i mean we don't need to know that and it'll just be a mystery of who shows up <laughs> it, it will be um because again it's not gonna your your board action together is not going to be dependent on people showing up in person you know the only recommendation i really would make is just for the record that we keep a log of these these court members attended in person and these court members attended virtually but you're not going to have to vote anymore on allowing people you know what's your reason for not showing up all the things that we're doing now okay hold on virginia um the upgrades that they're doing in the new room is that also a is your microphone on we can't never, yes it we is can't hear you okay i'm sorry um are the upgrades in the room also going to improve the wi-fi connection in the room because that's been our disaster most of the time. Well, uh, it'll, it'll be, uh, first of all, it really wasn't a, an issue with that. Uh, the problem was that we were all trying to log in with our computers and, and touch the network. Um, they have improved the uh, Wi-Fi there, but we won't need, the reason, let me, let me get back to the technology. When we do a Google Meet, all the draw that your computer uses when you're using your camera and your microphone is a big draw on the network. If, you're, if we're not doing that, like those people that will sit in the room, you won't have to do a Google Meet. You will be on a camera in the corner of the room. Everybody will see the entire room and hear the entire room. It will all be mic'd and recorded and speakered. So you won't have to have 10 computers in the room all tied into the network using the camera and the, and the uh, uh, audio. Um, so that will draw down on the Wi-Fi. It, it makes it so that when you're sitting here with your laptop or your iPad and you're tapped into the network, if you're just viewing data, you know, downloading a file and, and viewing it, it's a lot lower draw on the network. So you won't have that same problem. Our big problem had always been, we were trying to pot, put five, six, seven people in the room all of us Google meeting off of the same Wi-Fi connection. And it just was a bit uh, of a draw. Okay. They've incre increased that, they've made it better, but we won't have to worry about that anymore because it'll be one uniform system. Virginia. Is the change in policy permanent or is this a temporary change while we go through this emergency? Holly? Um, it, is, it is a permanent change um, because there was a change in state law. So this applies to all advisory committees, even the boundaries committee? Okay, thank it, you. Yes, it does. And this is gonna be read by the board this Wednesday? I mean, next Wednesday, a week from today? I believe so. August 18th, I believe. Okay. All right, and I guess you'll somehow let us know after it's been approved, Jim or, or Susan can, that, you know, that, that policy's been approved and that we can now meet virtually um or meet in person absolutely we'll make sure that you're aware of everything that happens there and what happens with the public even though we don't have a lot of public um they're allowed to still come to the room and still participate at a physical meeting uh, even if there's nobody there correct <laughs> okay. I'll, be, I'll be there i promise i'll be there too i'd rather meet in person um okay Anything else for, I guess, uh, staff updates? Okay. Any public comments? Two public people. <laughs> Nothing. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's get down to consent agenda. FC1. I still wanted that pulled. FC2. None. FC3. FC4. FC5, FC6, Yes. John wanted that, and so did I, okay. I think that was also noted in Jim's follow-up that that was gonna be pulled for a discussion. Mm -hmm. FC7, 
FC8, FC9, FC10, FC11, FC12, FC13. I feel like I'm doing bingo here. FC14. FC15, FC16, FC17, I believe staff wanted to comment, so that gets pulled. Yeah, I wanted that pulled too. Okay. John used the blower. Right. Yeah. FC18. Yeah. John wanted that and I wanted that. FC19. PC1. PC2, PC, PC3, PC4, I wanted that pulled, PC5. I wanted to discuss PC1. Okay. Need a motion to allow the ones that were not pulled to move forward by Virginia, um, second by Ken. Michael. Dave, was uh, FC3 pulled? FC3, as in Frank, Sam? It was not. It was not. Yes. If you'll pull that, please. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Michael wants FC3. Okay. We had the motion by Virginia, a second by Ken. All in favor of the ones that were not pulled going forward? Aye. Any aye, opposed? Aye. Okay. Um, I think I was the only one that pulled FC1. Um, yeah, and I think I, I think I made a mistake on that because it was on the follow-up questions and it was actually FC18 that I wanted. I think that we pulled already anyway. Yes, we did. So Dave, I've got some questions. On uh, FC1? Yes. Okay, That's go ahead, Michael. Um, there were a number that dealt with uh, installing double st uh, stair handrails on the stage. Is that going to be a design change for the future? Oh, okay. Go ahead, Jim. No, the, the stair rail issue was a mistake made by the consultant, and it's in the code, so they have to do it. Because that seemed to be on a, a couple of jobs, actually. Um, Plumosa as well as that Calusa. Handrails are heavily regulated and very specific to the use. So that's what happens when we get a building department review. Okay. Um, what are the pack lights? What are what, Michael? Wall pack lights. They're, they're uh, wall-mounted exterior lights that are very kind of compact. Um, they're used mostly for security areas or walkway areas. It's a type of fixture. Uh, is there a reason why there seem to be a number of those on this list on uh, the contingency use list this time? Um, is there a reason why those aren't handled as part of the original specs, what the add-on add is? Jim? Yeah, I can answer that. They're, they're included in every project. Um, as you know, we've on several occasions have asked for uh, the quantity of them to be increased because once we get on site and start working in the, in the actual spaces, we either add or detract some. Um, and it's all on an as-needed basis to make sure we have the right level of light on our walkways. I understand why they should be in, but it seems that these are being added after the fact as opposed to being part of the original uh, request for bid. Is that because the police department's adding these on after the fact? Usually the police don't have an issue in that. It's our building department that requires minimum light levels. And usually uh -huh. wall packs are included in most of our scopes. And every time we have one of those, we adjust them if, as needed in the field. All right. So, I don't understand why on this one there's so many of them that are being added after the fact. 
Michael, my only guess would be that the original architect and engineer missed providing the number that were needed. I mean, if you don't have enough light, it's not a mystery to be able to design to the correct foot candle level. Yes. Uh, Michael, as, as, uh, as Mr. Porter is mentioning, um, it, oftentimes what they'll do is they'll, they'll look at, a wall, at, at, a, at all the lighting there at a school, all the wall packs, and say, oh, it looks like there's three or four lights that are not working. They're completely out. And that'll end up being in the scope. And then when we get into the work, they start doing light level studies and realize, oh, you know what, there's, there are ones that are working, but over time, you know this, everybody knows their lights, they, they, uh, the uh, light output degrades over time. And because of that light loss, that's where building code comes in and says, You're, you've missed your light levels at certain areas, requiring us to do additional lights. Uh, moving down to uh, line 29, the Wellington High School, um, the press box structure. Uh, is there an indication as to how much the meeting manufacturer's requirements was? Because this item indicates that uh, the credits also were lumped into the, um, the item cost of about 18 grand. I'm gonna to have to research that for a second. All righty, you can get back to me on that. That's that's okay, not uh, not not a problem with that. Um, the change of occupancy centers and vacancy centers. I saw that in the follow-up that was addressed somewhat. Um, again, there seems to be a number of these that are popping up. Is there a reason why those aren't in the original specs? Yeah, because the. Uh... The building code now allows vacancy sensors instead of occupancy sensors. And so it's kind of the flip side of what we were required to install previously by the code, which is when you walk into a room, it picks up your occupancy, turns the lights on, keeps them on as long as there's motion detected. And then within a certain period of time when you leave, they go off. Well, now they're the flip side. The sensor will basically stay on unless it determines vacancy, which is probably a better use for classrooms. So I had asked Dave the same question as whether we're gonna go back and retrofit to change out the occupant our vacancy sensors. Um, and that's gonna be, you know, as funds exist and we go ahead and do that, but all future specs are gonna now have the vacancy sensors instead of the occupancy sensors. I guess we're assuming that a classroom full of students is not gonna appear silent and unmoving. Makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, and most of the sensors are both uh, infrared as well as um, sound. Um, yep. Ultrasonic, they, they pick up sound w waves as well. So um, even if there's no motion, you're gonna hear some little mumblings that'll keep the lights on. Do, do they still come on automatically when you come into a room or do you turn them on? I believe they have a switch now that you can turn on and therefore they will stay on unless motion is no longer detected for a certain period of time that you can program them for. So you can program it for five minutes or up to 30 minutes. So typically. when going into a restroom, you're gonna fumble for a light switch. Well, we're probably leaving restrooms on occupancy sensors, but the classrooms are getting changed out to vacancy centers because it just tends to be a better type of switch. And with, rest Sorry. And with restrooms, we have a much longer duration that they're on. So they, they, they might be an hour sensor before they go off. Uh, because as you said, during the day, they're always used. So um, they're not likely to go off during the day. In the evening hours, if no one's in there after six o'clock, by seven o'clock, it'll probably turn itself off. Uh, am I correct in assuming that there's a button override to turn the switch off if someone wanted to? Yes, both the occupancy and the vacancy sensors have override switches. But even the override switches usually have a certain length of time because um, the goal is energy savings. That's the reason the code requires those type of sensors so that lights don't stay on 24 seven and nobody's in the room. Thank you. If anyone else had any questions on FC1, um, I'll make a motion that Cork has no objection to the school board considering FC1. Virginia seconded, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. FC1 passes. All right, we're down to, Michael, you had FC3. Let me get to that if I can. Give me one second here. 
at C3. Oh, uh, open A, we'll find out. <laughs> I had it marked on here, my apologies. I'm dealing with another um, set of items here. Can we skip this and come back to it? My apologies, I've lost my notes on this. Okay. Um, down to FC6, and this was John pulled it, and it was open for uh, discussion by staff. Acreage Pines, FC6. <clears throat> John, you want to ask your questions? Well, yeah, I've got several questions on this. I mean, it says it's going to eliminate a fire pump, but I didn't see a credit for a fire pump, so I assume it was in the work to begin with, so it's really not, I'm, I'm not sure that's the right reason for it. I believe the reason for this is to comply with code, but that's what I want to hear, the history of it. Why did it take, this project's been under design since 2018, 2019? I mean, why does it take so long to get this, to get a permit for this work, I guess? Just curious what had happened here. Just briefly before I try to get Glenn on the, on the line, we had two schools in that area that, um, the fire pumps were on the suction withdrawing from a lake. And it's been a maintenance issue, a terrible maintenance issue for decades. And we're trying to get that off of the lakes and onto the public water system that's now available now at those two sites. Um, so that's definitely a maintenance request on those. Glenn, can you please help us with the chronology? I know that you sent us one and we were going back to 2018, I believe, on our initial attempt to get permission from Palm Beach County Water Utilities. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Great, it works. <laughs> um, just, just history. Um, once again, as, as Jim said, um, this, uh, for Loxahatchee Groves and Acreage Pines, um, Loxahatchee Groves is your FC 17. Uh, so it's gonna be right in line. The answers and questions are gonna be basically the same. Um, there's an existing fire pump at the school, uh, at both schools, uh, for the fire loop fire hydrants. Uh, and that's the only thing that's on this fire pump. The um, problems that the maintenance people have had, the diesel that we have sitting in those things, um, the age of the fire pumps, they've just had a lot of problems with them. So they asked to have these uh, removed off of the um, pumps and put into the potable water system. So at Acreage Pines, the potable water system actually is sent through our backyard to a, um, to a park where our meter is. Um, at Loxatchee Grove, they added the new uh, water line along the Chobe uh, Boulevard, and um, we actually were able to, uh, our potable water was tapped into that, but our fire hydrants were not at that time. So going along with uh, trying to get Palm Beach County Water Utilities, uh, Ingenuity uh, Group is the civil on both of these projects. We went to them to try to um, get an update on how we can do this working uh, with our existing fire hydrants, our existing fire hydrant water lines, meters, all that stuff. So when we went through it, they came back and told us that Basically, the, we could use our fire lines that we have, but they all had to be potholed and coupon, which is basically they go in and they drill into the pipe to see the condition of it. So we did that um, once we actually started the project. Um, so the design was working, but um, we had to hold off until we had contractor on site to uh, do the potholing and the drilling and, um, and all of the... Uh, requirements that Palm Beach County Water Utilities had asked us to. Um, so in doing that, we had to run pressure tests on one of the schools, the pressure tests we couldn't hold. Um, so we had to do a couple of different things with uh, Palm Beach County Water Utilities as far as opening up lines, taking a look at things, uh, replacing fire hydrants, um, and like things like that. So 
Palm Beach County Water Utilities came back and basically told us that um, we would have to replace all the hydrants we had on both schools. Uh, they did not want to have the older hydrants. They didn't want to actually have the hydrants and meet and um, actual gate valves for those hydrants uh, that had been subject to the lake water for the years that had been um, the fire pump had been in existence. So we started to work with them on that. This is all during COVID, so we could not have in-person meetings with them. Um, I don't know if any of you are aware of how Palm Beach County Water Utilities has been working, but we would be dropping our plans off at a desk out front in the parking lot for them to pick up, uh, for them to take a look at. And it, it was just a, it was, it was, boggled it, uh, me on how we could do it by um, by Google Meets or anything like that, but that's how they wanted to do it. So uh, there is a chronology that we sent out for both schools, and um, it, it actually shows the revisions that we've been made, the comments that we made, the, um, the second revisions we made, the third revisions we made. Those of you, John, especially, um, and I know that you probably had this with the county, Palm Beach County Water Utilities has been a, for 35 years I've worked with them, and I have one project I think that we were actually to get through um, pretty quickly. Um, and they, you know, they had uh, Adam Galecki before, now they have Jackie Michaels, and it's just really hard for us to get things through on the first try, the second try, even the third try. Um, and even to this day, while we're actually doing the work, um, we have, they've come out and made changes on locations of fire hydrants once we've actually had them in the ground. So it's been really hard to work with. Uh, the project uh, for the renewal, we kept going. Um, and at one point I even asked, uh, and I got with Dave Dolan and I said, do we actually want to keep this fire um, pump removal in our project because of the timeline that it was going to take. So we had already passed the point where I was going to be able to get it finished before the, um, the end of the regular project. We spoke with uh, maintenance about it, and because of the problems they've had, they said, yes, we definitely need to have it done. So we added in the time um, and the money to do it. Now, the additional funds on this is comes from when I have to replace hydrants, but most of it's coming from the re, re um, directing of the existing uh, or, or new water line. At Acreage Pines, like I said, the water line came in from a meter behind our property. Um, they required us to actually extend the water line about 1,500 to 2,000 feet across our front of our property and re and put a new water meter in and connect into our um our fire line that way and the fire line it, it almost seems simple that we would be able to connect into the fire line fire hydrants and work and all that but um we actually had to also make the fire line a loop system so that it wouldn't have stagnant water in it now we could have left it as um a not loop system but they would have required us a monthly flush on it um, that they would have to do since it's their water and their pipe, and they would have to do it. And I think at the time they told us it would be, you know, like $8,000 a flush. And then we had to also pay for the water that we were flushing out. So this, it's not as simple as we always wanted it to be. Uh, so we, and at both projects, again, we have new, new water lines that we put in, acreage pines, we changed the location of the um, water meter and added all the um, frontage of uh, the of new water line, even though it stops and goes nowhere after that. But when we're, when you're doing a project and even when we do a brand new project, Palm Beach County Water Utilities, and it's good, it's good practice by them. If you're putting a water line in, you had to extend it across your whole front of your property line so that somebody else can pick up from your property line into the next property. And we had this happen out in the glades on several projects also. Uh, at Loxahatchee Groves, I already had the water across the frontage, but um, where they they almost 
and, and I'm, we fought this and actually won this, they almost wanted us to kind of bring it on the side street um, for us to bring it through this, the whole side of our property. Um, we were able to circumvent that and uh, actually add in, but they also they asked, asked us to remove the water meter to a different area um, of our campus, which we had to do um, in order to get uh, the back flows and, um, and the connections into the fire line. So that's the history of the whole thing. Um, I wish I could do better with uh, Palm Beach County Water Utilities. Um, I've had I had similar problems over at um, Adult Ed. I had problems out in the glades when we were doing it. Um, and even going back as far as like Indian Pines 15, 20 years ago, um, I've had problems with trying to get things across the board. I mean, there it, it, you'd think that with agencies, you know, we would be able to uh, you know, help each other out a little bit, go across. But um, I think they have as much red tape as sometimes we do. Their bureaucracy is maybe a little bit more than ours. Um, but I mean, I, I'm not I'm not condoning what they do, but it, <laughs> it okay. just seems to be the norm. Okay, John, I'm sorry. Do you have further questions on that? Oh, yes, uh, I do. Um, Glenn, thank you for that. Uh, the key to this whole thing is getting the engineer in there at the beginning of the project meeting with water utilities and getting them to review your drawings and issue a permit. And that shouldn't take the three years that it took on this project. All the things that you mentioned about the pressure testing and the hydrants and the loop system, that's all just standard stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. The engineer should know all this if he has any kind of relationship with Palm Beach County or water utilities or any other water utilities. Well, John, I, I'm, I, forgive me on that one. I, that one I, I, I think Glenn was trying to allude to the fact that the scope wasn't originally in the project. It was added well after the fact. Now granted, it was added by maintenance, but it wasn't, I don't believe it was an initial, like our fire system worked. It didn't work well. We were pumping water out of the, out of the lake, but it did work. So I, I, I guess I kind of read this as yeah, this was a, a late change in the scope that was um, requested by maintenance, certainly justified and needed. And unfortunately, the, the, as Glenn alluded to in one of his comments, was <laughs> we basically had the choice of uh, ending the contract with Acreage Pines and Loxahatchee and calling it a day and build another project for this hydrant replacement, water line, fire pump, or just add it on to the end. So it's not a three-year extravaganza. Maybe it's a one-year extravaganza because of the, the time it took to get through, but it wasn't like it was something that there was in the, in the original design for the uh, engineers to pick up and work with water utilities. Okay, I didn't understand that from reading the backup, but if that's the case, that explains some of it. Um, regarding the description of the work that's on the change order as well as the board item, if you could scroll down and look a little bit right there, you can see it. No, just on the first page. I mean, right there, uh, description, added scope to the fire line and fire pump work. If what you're saying is correct, what you're doing is putting in a new fire line around the school and eliminating a fire pump to eliminate the existing fire pump. It's a very poor description, I think, and it says it also on the change order. Anyway, I think that ought to be a little bit more attention paid to that in the future. If you could go to page 11, I'm confused about the pricing. It's the backup from all site paving. Yeah. Uh, could you explain what's going on here? Uh, this looks to me like it's a half a million dollar change. If you sum of all changes, uh, amount of this change order is $447,995. And he's removing a previous change order. What's, what's that all about? So John, what they had on this is, um, I had at the last minute of our, uh, before GMP, we actually had an allowance for, um, replacement of um, fire pump uh, and thinking we were it would be a lot simpler than it has been so they 
the there they have a total change order here um but we removed um the portion of it that was for the allow that we used out of the allowance to do um previous work and um supplemented uh, the, this change order is actually supplementing our um our uh allowances could you scroll down a little bit more dave uh, same page you went, oh right there yeah, it talks about billing and allowance 10 and 11, 141,000. I guess my first question is, is that what this costs to put this fire line in? 447,000? Yes. Well, getting back to your point, Dave, I don't understand why the CM didn't bid this out. He just went to one contractor and he accepted his pricing. He should have bid this. A half a million dollars? and just handing it to the contractor. We gotta do better than that. Well, I, I, I appreciate your perspective. I, I don't want this to come, make it appear as though it was just handed out. It's not like we didn't have a third party estimate, make sure, making sure it's validated. I, I know you have issues with that part of it, but again, what you don't see is that this change order went through an extensive evaluation um, with Matt through AECOM that that third party valuation on this said it was it was a fair and reasonable price. It wasn't that it was, they just gave it to a contractor and said, eh, it's, it's within 50% of what it should be. Well, it was a fair and reasonable price. It's a fair, it may be a fair and reasonable price for a change order and that's how the estimator looks at it. But if this was bid out, I'm just curious what would have happened. Um, just one last point, if you can go to page 16. Uh, the CM on this is Pirtle Construction, and I just want to point out and um, applaud Pirtle for putting a project manager on the job only 50% of the time and a project coordinator 25% of the time, and that's it. That's their fee. That's the way it ought to be done, and I'm going to point out another CM on one of the other ones that, does just, that did just the opposite. He just loaded up the job. Anyway, that's all my questions on this one. Okay, anything else on FC6? Yeah, I had asked Lou. him before we all... Go ahead, Lou. Uh, by way of disclosure, I was on the Citizens Advisory Committee for Palm Beach County Water Utility Department for seven years. Went to monthly meetings, toured the facility, talked to the people, and reviewed projects. This project creates the impression, the way it's worded, that we get screwed by Palm Beach County Water Utility. Yeah. They weren't cooperative, they didn't work with us. I came from a completely different point of view because I was exposed to their operations for seven years. And this doesn't create the impression that I had after seven years of work. Their plants were pristine. You could eat off the floor of the waste disposal facility. They had a 100% energy operating uh, facility. They consumed and generated their own power for the complete waste treatment facility. And they were big on reclaimed water. So they did a fantastic job. I was there when Bevan Bidet ran it. And when he retired, Jim Stiles took it over. So reading this, there's a misconnect somewhere between the impression I had for seven years on the quality of that operation and how this comes over that the delay was caused by Palm Beach County Water Utility. I think the difference is you're talking about operation side and this is the plan review design side of utility. So this is like dealing with you know, a field building inspector versus an inspector that reviews plans in an office. I don't buy that at all. You got two different companies, you're telling me. Yeah. <laughs> Adam Galicki. Well, there's something wrong with our operation and their operation to take a year and a half to get a project going. So I just came from this from a completely different point of view, knowing what I already knew about the utility that caused the screw up and to spend all this kind of money. And, and if I may, um, Lou, I'll, I'll echo your sentiments in that Water utilities, I had, when I worked elsewhere, I had, um, I had similar opinions to water utilities as uh, Glenn. I had similar, similar experiences. But I also don't chalk that up to be, that's a lifelong circumstance. There may have been uh, reasons why they were challenged back in the day. They may, this may have just been a project that um, led to uh, multiple uh, readings from them. It's not to say that there's water utilities is you know the uh, the end all terrible place. 
this, this just seems like it was a circumstance where um, it took too many reviews. That is not an uncommon occurrence. I've been on the flip side and can say yes, there were times when I had consultants where I was disappointed in them for having not addressed all the comments the first time through, hence why a comment came back a second time. Those kinds of things happen, absolutely. I, I, I don't want to, I, I, as you said, I don't want to make it out as Water Utilities is a horrible organization that doesn't do, they do a fine job. And I'm sure in general they um, are on top of their plans and do the best they can to make sure that I uh, get a thorough review one time, get a project approved. In this particular case, I think that's, we're trying to suggest that these two circumstances um, were, would be then outside the norm. By two, you mean Lockahatchee in and, addition? And this one, yeah. They're both around the corner from each other. Because it's the same comment on both projects. Yeah, and they're both around the corner from each other. They both happen at the same time, same circumstance. And the same reviewers for the utility district. Yeah. Obviously, the job is done, the money is spent. You can't vote no on something that's already happened. But the impression that's creating is a, is a mystery. Yeah. It sounds like we were over our head on what we were trying to do, and we didn't consult with the technical experts early enough and often enough to make it go right. Okay, anything else on FC6? David, Michael has raised his hand. Okay, yeah, we can't see Michael here, so we don't know that. Michael, go ahead. Michael, are you there? Yes, uh, I have two areas. Uh, one on a more broader area. I want to follow up on the discussion. And I'm not going to play water utilities as the devil or the saint. Um, uh, as I've heard comments of, you know, in the last few moments. But what I am hearing, uh, or uh, let me ask this question, is there a systemic issue with us having to go back two and three times for plans, or was this really a one-off? So I, I can answer that a little bit. On Loxahatchee, there were 11 resubmittals. On Acreage Pines, 15 resubmittals. That's not reasonable. And it may be systemic, but at least on this, these two projects, it was more than we needed. All right. But so, Jim, excuse me, Jim, you don't know if that's due to the engineer just not responding to the comments or really, you, you really can't tell if that's the engineer or water utilities just changed their mind. Well, I agree with you, but I, I'm with, from personal experience, you'll respond to their question and then they'll change the question. It's, it's not easy to work with them all the time, John. I've gotten the same thing from different building departments, too. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll answer their questions, and then they come back with 10 more comments. It's just like, come on, man. Yeah. Give me your comments all, right. all the first shot. So what I'm hearing is more of a systemic type of situation without making a determination, but that's what it's sounding as. And we are not just a contractor within the county. We do a fair amount of work. And both the county and us, we have the same, if you would, customer. Um, it would seem that it would be appropriate to contact our engineers on these projects, get a list of where they think the problem is with water utilities, and then to have an upper level contact with water utilities to find out what we can do to avoid these things from happening on our future jobs. Uh, Michael, I don't, I don't believe our, co our consultants would be willing to comment. While I, I certainly appreciate that, if I asked, um, uh, and I've had, obviously I've been in that field, if I, if I asked my, uh, my cohort uh, of uh, consulting civil engineers if they'd be willing to go on the record and, and uh, be uh, uh, critical of water utilities, I, I'd, I'd be sitting in an empty room. So I, I, I can appreciate that and we're well, we, it might be worth the effort of um, trying to understand where our challenges are. Again, I, I go back to the your point. I, I don't think it's a systemic issue. I think um, just like every other um, agency, uh, you know, every other building department, there are ebbs and flows. There are challenges at times, and then some other times they're 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 spot on, and it's a smooth process. So I, I wouldn't necessarily automatically say it's a, um, a, a major problem. Um, what I am hearing, though, 
in terms of reports on projects is that this is systemic. All right, whatever label that at this meeting we may want to put on this is all great and good, but looking at this in the long run so that we don't have even three and four callbacks, which we shouldn't be having. I mean, if they are changing the field posts and they may think they have a good reason for it, I'm not gonna play them out as bad people, but we need to get in there and have a discussion with them as to what's going on because this is costing significant uh, citizen dollars, time and dollars. And as a project manager, we shouldn't be allowing this to occur. Michael, we don't have the power, and I can tell you from my experience, my career, it, it's an age-old problem, whether it's a building department or whether it's a utility review department. Um, we just have to deal with it. Um, you know, obviously, if we have an engineer that's just ignoring the comments coming back, yeah, that we can deal with because we're hiring the engineer. But when it's a public utility company, I mean, it's like dealing with FPL. I mean, FPL is very difficult to deal with as well. You're not going to change FPL. I don't care if you go all the way to the president of FBL. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, but, but what I do is I get a hold of someone at the proper level that deals with the two supervisor over at FPNL, and we deal with it that way. I mean, if we have to get uh, one of our division directors to deal with uh, someone there or the superintendent to deal with the county manager at that level, put it on their list of their discussions, then let's ask for that to be done. All right, if, if it's all right, I don't, I don't want to belabor the point as far as uh, systematically trying to figure out how to make water utilities better. I will, uh, I'll take it upon myself to work with administration and see if there's a path forward to meeting with the senior, senior officials at water utilities um, if it's deemed that there is a systematic failure um, on their part. And in fact, there's, you know, people with uh, living in glass houses don't throw stones. So we'll be, we'll be uh, judicious with our approach. Sounds good on that. Uh, the second part is, is what do we do with something like this where we do have such a huge change of order and it should have been bid out and I'm not very comfortable voting yes for this. Well, it's already been done. So we can vote against it, but the work's been done, right? Yes. In progress. I mean, that's the problem is that, uh, and I understand the problem. I mean, folks who in good faith uh, have done their work, they need to be paid and all. Uh, on the other hand, I'm looking at something that should have been bid before it got to us. Well, again, I, I, I appreciate your perspective and I appreciate John's perspective, but again, it's, it's somewhat of a slap in the face to staff. It's as though uh, I get a feel like there's, there's no staff oversight, there's no staff review that the value that was presented, I mean, again, it's, it goes back to the, the issue we had previous, uh, two or three months ago when I said, you guys see the change order in the final, final version. You didn't see the four versions that came before it where we ripped it apart, shredded it, made them start all over and cleaned it up. The final version that you see is a good and fair and reasonable price. I have people that work, and, and also we have an architect involved in this too, and, and a civil engineer. If they felt it was out of, out of hand, um, I work with many of these civil engineers. They wouldn't stand for it. They wouldn't allow us to take a change order forward because they know better. They know their reputation is at stake. If something like this comes back and I turn to that civil engineer, Ingenuity, and say, you guys are being called on, on the carpet too for allowing this. They don't want their reputation solid. I guarantee you they're going to say that that is a fair and reasonable price. Um, yes, um, you may have a, a point about whether it should have been a bid as a separate project but the price that was uh, attained, um, I'm, I'm very comfortable with it being um, the, the appropriate uh, price for the project. I would respectfully request that you withdraw the comments that questioning a decision is a slap in the face at staff. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. I would ask as a second part as to what 
when this came along, why wasn't it segregated out to be rebid at that time? Uh, expeditious nature. We had a contractor yeah. that was finishing up. He was on site. And he was able to uh, do this while the um, activity was um, fresh. We'd, uh, otherwise, we'd have to put out a, um, an RFP and uh, bid the project separately. Take, would have taken more time. Uh, Dave, I was suggesting earlier that Perlin should have bid it out. They could have gotten bids quickly, so you wouldn't have to do all the paperwork. Do we have anything in any of our policies, and we're considering one of the policies today for contingency use of what the maximum amount is before something has to kick in to require competitive bidding? The policies require us to go to the school board at, after a certain level, so there's um, delegated authority has strict limits, and thereafter we present the data to the school board, and it's up to us to pre present the data that proves our case. What's the level? The level to the school board is what, 250? On change orders, anything, any single individual item over 100,000 has to go to the, to the school board. Any accumulated um, change orders over 250,000 has to go to the school board. But that's for a total job, all the aggregate buildup. Aggregate. But a single change order of 100,000 or more has to go to the school board. Correct. Right, so this one goes to the school board, obviously. Yes. Correct. Okay. All right, anything else on this one? Um, we've had a lot of discussion, Virginia. I think it's time to stop discussion and move this forward. That's a motion, do I have a second? Second. Second by John, any other discussion? All in favor of allowing this to go forward to the school board, aye. Aye. Opposed? Michael? Nay. Michael's opposed, okay. Your opposition reason, Michael, you thought it should have been bid out and, and as a, a separate job? Correct. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Did they revise the policy if there's a negative vote from Cork, it has to be explained to the board? I don't believe that policy part changed. There was a question in one of the reviews on the policy and procedure whether that was still in effect or whether that was being proposed to be changed. I'm pretty sure that we still have to justify negative votes. Okay. Yes, that didn't change, Lou. Okay. Don't worry, Lou. I'll keep you in business. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's uh, FC6. We are down to FC17. Is Michael ready with uh, FC3 before we Oh, yeah. Michael, do you have FC3? Right. Yeah. So um, I saw, and Dave, I appreciate your um, uh, follow-up with uh, staff beforehand. But I'm wondering at what point, and this actually somewhat relates to what we just discussed, at what point when we start getting into these changes, do we reevaluate the economic viability of the change? And this is the one with the VAVs that was uh, for what, 100 grand plus? Yeah, the, the VAV boxes had to be changed out, and it became just a, a, a site condition that the building department observed that they couldn't be changed out to meet the current code with what was specified. And they didn't know that until they got the ceilings torn apart, I believe, to be able to see the units and the space that they had to deal with. My understanding reading this was that this was more in line with a discretionary change as opposed to that this had to be done at this time. Um, if, I, if I could clarify that, uh, we got down, down there to change out the VAVs and our instructions to our consultant and our, design, and our contractor was to replace in kind. We didn't think just by taking one out and putting one in that we had to do anything different, but the code inspector at the time we put them in required us to meet current codes for clearances and we could not meet them. It caused great turmoil in our project and we've been struggling with it, and this is the culmination of that effort to get the VAVs correct in that school. Was the building code interpretation correct? We, we challenged it with um, Mr. Hogarth, and he confirmed that his inspector was correct, and we were going to follow their directions. So will that now become our standard to go with bottom access air handlers at the time we design a job so we don't end up having to do a change out again? 
Correct. Building Code Services is now guiding our um, designers and heading them toward bottom access VAPs. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, need a motion on FC3. Michael, you want to make it? Uh, Cork has no objection to the school district considering FC3. Need a second. Virginia seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. All right, we are down to FC 17. I believe that might have been the same discussion we just had. Yes. Lou, you pulled that one? Yeah, it's the same reason. Okay, and you're okay with that now? Yes. Okay, you want to make a motion? Make a motion to go forward, FC 17. Need a second? Virginia, any opposed? Any, all in favor? Aye, any Aye. opposed? Okay. Uh, John, you and I pulled FC 18. Right, this is one for our storefronts and doors. They've added seven hollow metal doors to the project. And again, this is half a million dollars. A lot of money, $66,000. Is that right for door? Seems like a lot of money. And again, I don't understand why the contractor, the CM, didn't get bids on this. We just went to the same guy. I understand you guys reviewed the change order costs and all, but. Um, I'm not sure who the CM is on this, but they should have gotten bids. Um, my other comment, if you could go to page 48, Dave. Oh, sorry. Uh, I figured out, finally figured out I can type in the number. Yeah. <laughs> Technology. Yeah, let's scroll down. There you go. Get that whole thing in there. Uh, you, I mentioned earlier how Pirtle was just charging us for 50% time for a PM on their after substantial completion work. This is also after substantial completion. And uh, this CM is charging us for a full-time PM, a full-time superintendent, uh, project exec on the job every once in a while, and the SBE partner administration. I mean, if you just, you look at that, that all adds up to, I think, $1,200 a day of CM fee where Pirtle was doing their project for $331 a day. Um, the SBE partner administration, I'm not quite sure what that is. I mean, that's alone $360 a day. So that just, that's even more than what Pirtle was charging. So I just wonder if staff has any comment think, on that. Yeah, um, and forgive me, I, I could be wrong on this one, so I uh, caveat that. But the partner administration was on those larger high school ones. Um, we did have uh, a requirement in the RFP that they had a uh, small business partnership. Well, that was true of the Pirtle one, and he didn't charge. And he didn't charge. But I think, I don't want to speak to Pirtle's circumstance, but I think the contract would have expected that uniformly they do so. Well, don't you agree that a uh, full-time PM and a full-time superintendent is a little bit to watch the subcontractor put in some doors and take them out? That's all they're doing is watching them. I, I can see the variation, um, and, and uh, I know we, we had gone through this exercise um, when Virgil was here a couple of years ago, where we have we have that spreadsheet where we kind of anticipate what the average costs on the staffing is supposed to be on a facility renewal, and we broke it down to being per a per week charge, right? I, I think you right we uh, showed you, I think we didn't put it up there, but we showed you how we came about the basis because some projects um, uh, the, the team might have uh, much higher uh, superintendent charge because it was a senior superintendent Hourly rate, yeah. um, but so he's worth it as long as you give me five percent of the PM because I don't really care the super, super is going to be great so it really depends on how they set it up so I, I don't want to speak to that that this is this is too much but I understand the circumstances that you're referring to that this compared to Pirtle looks like they have a different, completely different setup. Well, that goes up here when I next selection committee meeting when Proctor's in front of us. I'm going to remember this. Understood. Appreciate it. Can I can I can I clarify a few items with that, David? Yeah, uh, yeah. This, uh, is, this Joel. is Joel, by the way. Joel Campbell. Joel's the project manager for. Uh, Go ahead, Joel. This um, the 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 original. It, this, this is actually increasing the allowance. The allowance is for windows and doors. Um, in this fee, of, in this change order, is also to replace and all the work involved in doing 25 windows as well. The windows 
are not purchased yet, those windows, because we want to get through this change order first. Um, but the, change, the, the windows themselves would be purchased through the allowance money. So it's more than just those floor fronts. It is also installing 25 windows as well. And then this is work done, I think what you were saying on hurdles, I think that work was probably done maybe during, I don't, I don't know if it was done during the, the time frame of their job or after substantial complete, but this is completely after. It'll be completely done before they even start this work. And uh, John, I, I think, may, Joel, tell me if I'm wrong, but I understood this to be that we had an allowance in for the storefront for a certain percentage of storefront. And this is just Correct. for a change order to increase the amount of storefront we're doing. So it's not like right. we didn't bid it out. It was an allowance up front. So, you know, we're just extending the allowance, if you will. So yes, that's what we're and and again I'm, I I will stand corrected on this if, if I'm wrong, but Proctor did need to put this out to bid. That's the concept of the allowance. So if the information's not there for you, John, let me get back to you afterwards on it to, to validate the fact that they went out for multiple bids okay. to their vendors. Because that's, that's I, I understand your point, but I just wanted to make sure that it was understood that this is more of an extension of an existing scope. It's not like the water utilities part where we were doing something totally different this was, we were doing 25 windows, now we're doing 50 of the same type of thing. That's the yeah, it was the same type of thing. That's, that furthers my reasoning why he needs a full-time, he doesn't need a full-time superintendent and a full-time PM on the job. But Again, that one I'm not going to argue with yeah. you. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have to research the, the, the weighting of that to make sure it's, it's still in line with our, our estimates. But this was done outside the scope, the other scope of the work. I mean, the other work was already complete, and he's coming back to do this, I take it. Joel, can you answer that? Oh, correct, yes. He'll be coming back to do this work, yes. Okay. Yep. Question I had raised, and the, the, the responses came back is, you know, why weren't we using aluminum instead of steel? And I understand that MMPO thinks that steel will hold up better. So, Joel, is this galv is this, are these frames galvanized uh, steel, or are they just plain painted steel? No, they were galvanized. They met the specs. Our okay. specs call for galvanization on the hollow metal. The you can use according to our specs and design standards, you can use uh, aluminum for storefront, but not the doors. The doors you have to get a variance for to use uh, aluminum storefront doors. Okay, so but we're doing an entire storefront of steel, correct? None, none, nothing's aluminum. No, oh, we're doing all hollow metal for our storefront. Now the windows, the windows are a window slash storefront type of window. They're large windows. They go floor to ceiling. I think they're five to six foot wide. There's 40, if we do them all, there's 40, 45 of them. Um, and those are all open. Okay. So do we, do we then field paint these or do we have them powder coated for extra protection? Um, they are an anodized aluminum. They're going to be the purple color. Just no, I guess I'm, ta I'm, I'm talking about the hollow metal that's galvanized. Is that field painted? Oh, yeah, yes. It's got, it comes galvanized. Uh, it's got the red primer on it. And then they, they paint them in the field. Yeah. They grout them. They, they cook the inside of the frame. They grout them completely before they're actually installed in the opening. Then they get installed in the opening. Um, and then they paint the, the complete system. And these are very large systems. Some of them have two doors in them. The majority have two sets of doors. They're, they're, they're massive. Really yeah, massive. no, I'm okay with that. I want to make sure we were doing galvanized if we were not doing aluminum because plain steel would hold up about as long as the punch list. Um, yeah, they, well, they're last in these schools, Wellington and Spanish River. I mean, they're 40 years old, I believe. Um, and you know their windows and doors are reaching the end of their life at 40 years. Right. Okay. Thanks. Any other comments or questions, Lou? Yeah, I had a question. I have a note that says there was a substantial completion on this job, and then a final completion. Was this a two-phase package? Dave. 
Okay. You have your, your substantial completion date, and then you have your final completion. Yeah, I had all the. I had a year between the two dates, and I was wondering, did I misread something? I don't. I think you must have. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually about three or four months. And we'll go back and check that, Lou, because I, if, if, we've, if we've misdated something. I, I had an August 20 and then a September 21. But uh, mm -hmm. just check it. It seemed there was a strange to have substantial completion and final completion a year apart. But I may have misread a number. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll check back on that and make sure we clarify the information. Okay. But no, according to what Joel just said, is there isn't a year between the two. Yeah. No, there's not. Okay, anything else on uh, FC 18? Right. Um, since this job is moving, is still continuing, is there going to be any comments back to the uh, project regarding use of staffing? You mean internal staffing or the CM staffing? CM staffing. Uh, since the job is done, I guess that change order accounts uh, for the staffing charge, correct, David? Um, I may have misunderstood. I thought that they said that the first still have to be done. Jim? But it's off yeah. the windows. The, the windows still have to be installed. Of course, the project all done. On this project, Spanish River, this work cannot start until November or October when the, um, the parts actually get here. So I think John's comments regarding staffing uh, should be relayed back to the project. It's only, if, if you're suggesting we need to change the price of the change order, I don't think that's uh, reasonable because we did a good, fair, and reasonable estimate against that, and it would delay the ordering of the materials that we need to construct the project. Jim, I, I think I would suggest that you know, we go ahead with this change order, but then you go back to Proctor and tell them that Cork objected to their costs, and do they want to voluntarily change those costs? I would agree. Or do they want to defend them? I would agree. And then if they give us the money back, we can do a change order or a PCD or whatever. And that's the, that's the thing. I can hold their feet to the fire on the staffing charges. I can't hold the feet, their feet to the fire on the cost of the materials that we need to purchase. So yeah, I'm in, I'm in agreement if that's... Uh, Joel, so we'll work, we'll work on that afterwards, after the fact. We'll make sure that uh, okay. we, we follow through on these, uh, make sure that they're in line with what we expect they, uh, they, they should be on, that, on this type of scope. Well, and I guess also, as just a lessons learned, what you're hearing from Cork is that even when your staff sees pricing like this, that it needs to be kind of called into question before Cork even calls it into question. Even if it works out that you agree with them, right. then present it wholeheartedly, and we need to accept it. Absolutely, and that's why I, I, I'm not I'm not acknowledging that this is wrong. Right. No. What I'm saying is I'm going to go back and look at it against our standards, and if it is in line, then we don't do anything. Then we're okay. If it's if it's too high, then we certainly will beat them down and, and pull it back. That's why I'm not acknowledging that it it is too high yet. I want to find out for certain. I want to see that if that balance of the right staffing is, you know, if they choose to have more of a project manager and, and superintendent and less of something, we'll, we'll figure that out and, and try to validate it. I'm sure, John, you've probably done so already, but I want to do it against <laughs> the basis that our standard, our district standard for all projects is. Mr. Barbieri, you had something? Mr. Dolan, if, if, you decide, if you decide that you're going to bring it back, what are you going to do about the board meeting next week? Will you mo modify the agenda item before the board gets it next Wednesday? Now, this, this wouldn't go, this would stay with you. Um, I have the, the, the ability um, after this gets executed to insist that they renegotiate and pull their, their staffing charges down. I can't change the cost of the actual uh, storefront that they need to buy. That's a, a set price. But what I can do is on their pay applications, I can insist that this, these values, if it turns out they're too high, I can pull those down myself. We can do those as a, an administrative effort. So um, wouldn't their defense be that the board's already approved this amount of money? Is, it, is this part of the agenda item that we're gonna approve next? This is next part week? of the agenda item. And what, what we always do is, and on CM projects, this is an upper limit. It's basically the, the, the CM at risk 
is a top dollar value. In, in some cases, they'll do a change order and they'll put in uh, $10,000 worth of staff time. When they actually implement it, they end up showing us that they only used $8,000 worth of staff time. They give us $2,000 back. I will be able to do that now instead of waiting until the end and keeping our fingers crossed. I will be able to validate that, nope, that, that shouldn't be um, $85,000. It should be in the range of $65,000. And they'll look at it and see if they can tweak it and make it happen for sixty-five. dollars if that's the, co the correct cost. So it doesn't have to change the change order. It, the change order is simply an upper limit value for, that, uh, for this work, and we'll, we'll pull them down on it if need be. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, motion to go forward with FC 18. I move that we go forward with FC 18 to the board without objection. Need a second? Second. Second by Lou. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. What's the negative uh, reason, Michael? The reason is, is that staff has to get back to us regarding the bidding and staffing issues, and I'm not comfortable voting on it until hearing that. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, that takes care of FCs. Uh, let's see, we had um, PC4. Oh, Lou, you wanted uh, PC1? PC1, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a pre-qualification proposal. We're, uh, yeah. We renew vendors after three years if they do more than $300,000 worth of business. Years ago, there was a question about whether we were reviewing any legal ramifications of the vendors we did business with. And the vendors have to disclose any legal. The question was whether the vendors were being honest and disclosing it. As a result, the legal department here agreed they would do a review of the registries in the various legal organizations around here and see if there were any items that were listed as open in the legal register that weren't reported by the vendors. And that's worked very, very successfully. However, if you look at this package, there's, I think, nine vendors for requalification. Virginia was right. It's 404 pages. We're not going to review 440 pages. So there can be an introductory consolidation sheet that says we're looking at so many vendors at $300,000. It might be nine. And they're either new or the requalification. So you could say so many new seat requalification. And then are there any exceptions in the course of the review that could be highlighted rather than giving us 150 pages of every legal uh, action that Moss has taken in the last 20 years? Moss today is a $1 billion corporation, and they do business all over the world. And we're not interested in looking at 100 pages of all their legal paraphernalia, 99% of them a settled out of court or a reasonable settlement, the ones that are open are usually in negotiation. So I think the upfront legal review is excellent, but I don't need, we need all that backup material. I'd suggest we can consolidate that area, save some paper and just give us a highlight of it. Okay. Um, yes. Do you want Holly? So no, that's no? a suggestion, I don't know okay. that, you know, there's no vote on what we okay. have. Can, well, yeah, can we take that up with legal and, and see, uh, that, see if That we can... would be fine with me. There's okay. no objection there. There's nothing there that I would say, hey, you know, there's wrong or error. But well, it, sound, it sounds like you're asking kind of like for an executive summary that we could just look at and the board could look at and go, okay, here, look, here's our new vendors, one page. Here's our renewal vendors, two pages. Here's that email from Holly saying she's checked everything and nothing is undisclosed. Yeah, because That's all we care about. The backup is great. And there's no problem there. So that would be a great idea. Okay, Jim. Can I just ask a point of clarification? Yes. So you're, you still want all the backup data that we give you in PC1. That's a, a huge effort by our purchasing department to create that for you. Well, Are again. You asking for that now in the summary? Hold on. I, my understanding is everything we get is what the board gets and wants. Okay. So if the board doesn't want 400 pages of backup on PC contractors, then we don't need it either. Okay. That's what I'm hearing, yes. I, th I think we're looking to be able to tell the board, okay, here's new, here's renewal, here's a legal check, everything's fine, let them in. Understood. Yes. Okay, okay. so yes, we, uh, I think we're, we're all on the same page. Okay. Yep. Uh, excuse me, if I, Dave, if I may, or Jim, I'd like to- Go ahead, Mark. Throw a comment. Um, the backup that's included with the pre-qualification item is there because over time it's been requested by members of CORC. 
Um, I can assure you that years ago, we did not include all of the um, emails that show the results of the litigation in the background uh, that, that legal provides, but they, they were requested and that's why they're there. So, you know, what I'm hearing is, you know, basically it's there for courts review at their pleasure. If they would like to review details, it's available to them. The synopsis of who's being recommended for new uh, pre-qualification and who's being recommended for renewal are on two pages that are bookmarked in PC1, new and renewal vendors. If you just want to look at new and renewal, that's fine. Uh, for those of you that are inclined to look at the backup, it's there. And I think that's important to some of the members of court. Um, however, after spending literally hours and hours a week of my staff time and legal staff time and the committee members time to prepare an executive summary to, you know, mitigate the volume of backup that has been requested by Quark seems a little bit redundant and you know, quite onerous on my staff to have to do that in addition to the other workload we currently have. Well, I think so what we were saying. Those, those are my comments. Yeah, Mark, I think what we were suggesting is to dump all the backup for what you show us, reverse what we may have said before, because we're all getting older and so we don't remember what we told you. Um, and, and, then, and just basically give us only that kind of executive summary. But what I'm saying, Dave, is we still have to go through the legwork okay. of going through the research of vetting the applications of asking legal to review and get back to us with the disclosures and the, and the uh, you know, all of the information that pertains to um, whatever legal um, issues they've disclosed or not disclosed. Okay. And, you know, three months later, there's going to be a question and then there's going to be the comment that initiated this in the first place. <laughs> Can I see the backup? Where's the backup? Yeah. Uh -huh. And I'm not going to, you know, that was requested by not more, more than one court member when, when we initiated that a few years ago. Okay. And I'm sure they'll recall. So I, I right, really Mark. think that uh, that's, that's my comment. Right. I'll just end it there. All right. Thanks, Leah. Mark. Leah. Yes, I just um, wanted to ask a question on the purpose of the disclosure for the litigation. I would think that it's, it's the disclosure is one thing, but I think the, the real purpose behind it is to really look at performance issues. Have there been performance issues in the past? So I do, I would, if we could find some happy medium to have sufficient information so that if anyone wanted to, to um, yeah, look at that then, because it's about performance in the past, which could mm -hmm. affect performance in the future. Holly, you're on? You're muted. I see that and I'm trying to get my mouse over from the other screen. Um, you know, we review the litigation pursuant to policy 7.08. Um, you know, when I joined the district, there was a discussion as to the purpose of it. Um, however, now I, it's done just as a matter of course. Um, we want to make sure that our contractors provide information on their litigation. It's also required by SREF. Um, so that's kind of the purpose behind it and uh, why it's incorporated in our board policy. I think just then keep it, if, if the documentation's already been done, then just keep it that way. And Lou, I think what we'll need to do is just weed through what we each personally want to look at. Because quite frankly, I look at the new vendors, I look at the renewal vendors, I look at any litigation, and I look at Holly's report saying there's no additional litigation that has not been disclosed, and that's all I look at. So I might look at a dozen pages. Sorry, and if, if that's what, you know, Cork, if you guys all collectively agree on something along those lines, we'll make it happen. Just let us know exactly how you, you want to approach that. Well, but it sounds like Mark's already doing all the work anyway. 
And so if he gives us the extra documentation, we can look at it or not look at it. I don't know, think about it in staff, and if there's a, if there's a way to simplify it, that's fine. If not, I mean, it, it, simplifying it shouldn't be taking and making more work. Oh, and if, if, if I'm... You, if okay. you look at the Moss package alone, the number of active policies, the number in process all over the world, it's got to be 150 pages in that, which is just pure nonsense. There's got to be a way to summarize it like they've suggested. And if I may... Um, Kind of expand on one of the, on this topic um, a little bit further. Um, I, I've talked with a couple of the core committee members about um, the size of the files and how it works on board docs, light where you have to download each file individually and it's painful and, and drawn out. Um, I, I, I'd look for feedback. You can send me or Susan directly individual feedback. If you'd prefer, we can do things like. Uh, um, put them all on a Google Drive. You know, Google is our Google suite. And put them on a Google Drive, and I think, Leanne, I think you guys use that for like ISOC and things like that, where we can send you a hyperlink, and you can go right to it and pick all the files all at once, drag them over into your, your computer, and be done with it. Go ahead. They would have to have a Google email address to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that's, that's easy, easily done. Yeah. So it, it's... I go back to the days of three ring notebooks that we had come down here and pick them up and carry them home. <laughs> yep. So what we got is marvelous, but any suggestion would certainly be helpful. Certainly. Yep, some two inch thick books. Virginia. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not a fan of Google Drive, but um, if everybody wants it, I guess I'll suffer with it. But I believe we ask for the separate files because they're much faster to download and I don't want to go back yeah. to having these tremendous big files to download. Right. So even if you put it on Google Drive, I don't want those big, big heavy files. Okay, and we're, we're doing everything we can on it from a technical standpoint to try to reduce the actual gigabytes or megabytes of these files. Mm -hmm. Some of it, it, it can't be helped. For example, some of our change orders include uh, drawing files you know, the change order includes the details from the design changes, and those drawing files are massive files. Yeah. There's a lot of data that's embedded in it, and oftentimes, and I have the same thing on pay applications. I know you guys don't care about that, but for some of our pay applications, she does, um, 40 and 50 megabyte files because there's PDFs attached to it that are included in it of drawing files, and it just bogs down the system, but they're kind of required. Um, I know Mr. Gelfand and I had talked about some ways to try to improve upon it. I'm working with the IT folks to see if there's ways we can do things to kind of condense them and make them smaller files, but the, ultimately we recognize the data has to be there. You need every page. Right. Mm. But, but please don't merge them all together again. Oh, no, no, no. We, I just, instead of having to click on them individually, like a Google Drive or a, what, what's some of the other ones? Uh, you can do a share Dropbox. Dropbox, Dropbox, things like that. You can go on and with your cursor, click the first one, click the last one, and hit download, and it'll download them all to your computer with one click, and you're done. As opposed to on board but, docs, you have to, you know, there's 25 uh, files, and you have to click on each one and download it. Virginia, I think, I think the idea is they're going to leave everything the way it is, but try to make an accessory for those of us that want to just do a one click and download 40 files at one shot. You, you continue to put it within the, the board document. And I mean, the, they'll, they'll put it where they need to. But only, your stuff let, would, only let people who like Google Drive go there? You I really don't like Google Drive. No, I, you won't have to do anything different is yeah. what's going to be remain. Absolutely. So you would be able to do that. And the documents will still need to be on board docs regardless. That's the official record. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Just trying to make it easier for people who don't want to go through that uh, arduous process. So back, back to PC1 so we can get a motion and move on from that. My thought is we've had this discussion off and on for m many years, and I just think we leave it the way it is. Um, if staff can come up with a way to simplify the, the volume of documents, fine. But I think we still need the information somehow. I guess I'm old enough uh, to remember when it was requested that. Yeah, yeah I know that. I can't remember who, but there were several people. I know. Who wanted to see it all? Yes. Anyway, Lou, you you had to pull down. You want to make a motion to go forward, PC one. We make a motion to go forward on PC one. 
You second. Ken seconded. All in favor of PC1? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. Uh, I had pulled PC4 kind of as a general discussion item. That was the last one to be pulled. So, Dave, question. When we hire a CM to do, uh, to follow the architect, we hire the CM at the beginning, we hire the architect at the beginning. The CM is, is tasked with working out prices and keeping the architect on budget and modifying designs and modifying material choices all the way through until they get up to the time the architect is done with the drawings and then they, the CM goes out to bid to multiple subs to get us a GMP. Is there any repercussions for a CM all the way along saying, hey, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, your budget's good, your drawings are good, then they put the thing out the bid and it comes in so astronomically different. We have paid them for their services during the CM process to keep things on budget. And then I don't think there's any repercussions in our contracts that says, I'm sorry, man, you were millions and millions of dollars off in everything you did, all the way up through design, design development, we were paying you a handsome number to keep it all on budget. And now we got to value engineering the heck out of this job because you blew it. No, there is not anything in the contract specifically to penalize. We, we do recognize that our PPEs are a very valuable tool to ensure that the uh, contractors and consultants, for that matter, are um, admonished. And, uh, and ultimately, I think somebody had mentioned before, oh, you'd mentioned before, yeah, I'll remember on the next time around when I do a selection committee. And that's really the intent of these, because um, I think from a, the standpoint of work performed, they may well say, we performed the duties. We may not have performed them quite as well as they could have, but they'd say, we've done the work, we're entitled to be paid for that. I don't necessarily agree with it. I think you and I probably see similarly on this, but no, there's nothing in the contract to prevent it, um, short of um, smacking them over the head when they do their next soli uh, solicitation. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think, you know, even if John's on a committee, he's one voice and one vote to say, okay, contractor XYZ, I know you screwed up on another job, mm -hmm. you overbuilt us. So therefore, I'm going to score you low. And you got six other people on the committee, and they may not have had that same experience. Well, I guess I'm just throwing the thought out there for you and staff to think of something you may or may not want to bring back to court to act as kind of a, a little liquidated damages type penalty exactly. uh, against the CM for not doing what they're getting paid to do. Because as, as you say, we, I, pr I appreciate that sentiment because the architects do. If, they, if there's a failure over a certain threshold, they owe us money at the end, right? We, we end up taking money back. So there is a penalty, an actual monetary penalty for the, uh, the consultant, um, but there is no, currently there is no, to my knowledge, Jim, please speak up, there is no penalty for the CM and failure to um, perform their duties admirably in the pre-construction phase. Yeah, because I mean, right now with prices as volatile as they are, if a CM is not pulling in certain chief subs during that pre-con work, then they're just using their historical numbers, which are old news, um, to try to come up with the plumbing price and the HVAC price instead of actually pulling a sub in. And again, we don't tell them how to do their pre-con. So if they're not doing their due diligence and really getting current day prices from the marketplace, then they're, they're, they're putting us at risk. I could add one point, Mr. Yes. So we're often tempted at the time we bid projects to take bids on stuff that we may or may not be able to afford because then we get the hard unit price. Mm -hmm. And we can bring that into the contract at an unescalated rate later on. So it does have a benefit to us to value engineer after we take bids. Yeah, I'm just talking about a CM that just completely blows HVAC number. Um, they just used their historical numbers they had in their files from empirical data on five other jobs a year ago. Well, all the prices a year ago are no longer prices they're getting today. And they haven't pulled in a sub necessarily to help them validate their guesstimate for the current job. And then they put it out to bid for the, the GMP and reality sets in 
and then it becomes our reality to go, okay, we can't meet that number. So. We appreciate that sentiment, and if it's okay with you, we will certainly do it as a follow-up to, uh, for at least for a f further discussion. If we come up with some suggested ideas, we'll present them to Cork, um, get your feedback on, on that. Thank you. Um, you know, motion to go forward with PC4, Virginia, you need a second? Ken, all in favor of PC4? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. All right, we are done with consent. Okay, in progress FCA work. Snuck up on you. Sorry, bear with me, technical. I don't know how to do this thing very well, do I? <laughs> Better at it. Okay. My PDF. All right. Um, again, I'm going to preface this. This is kind of like last month's where I said it was a little bit shorter than uh, past years, uh, past months. This one will even be shorter, and um, and I'll give you the reason why um, we'll <laughs> when I get there. Um, so this is our standard monthly um, layout of the. Uh, Revenues generated, the uh, and the money we're ex we've expended, and our participation with within diversity. Still very pr proud of those uh, pr proud of those numbers. Um, as you can see, we're keeping up um, as the money comes in. We're we're committing. Um, we're we're a hundred million behind, but w those are projects that are in the process. So we will be committing more towards that, and expending as we're, we're spending it as quickly as we can. Um, and trying to keep up with that which we expended. Um, the solicitations, same as, same as last month. Um, you can see there's some of them are packaged together. There's a number of facility renewals coming up. These are the FY22s. Um, uh, we've got uh, Roosevelt, full, sorry, Roosevelt Full Service is on there. There's a Timber Trace core expansion. That's our next one up. I think it's the only one we have this year. Um, in addition, um, other ones coming up, we have Windbrook modernization and Pine Grove modernization. As we're now in cycles where we have, uh, right now we're in the middle of design on Malaluka and Grove Park, and they'll be going to construction soon. We're now going to be um, advertising to hire the designers in the con uh, con uh, CM for Windbrook and Pine Grove and West Riviere. Um, um, that, um, that's, a, that's an added, added modernization, so um, we're excited about doing that. Um, you can see it's, it's a little ways out, a few months out from those. And as well, we're working on, a, on our transportation projects. We've got um, a consultant that we're working, pushing forward on um, a lot of the programming for that. So we still have plenty of work to come out um, in, in coming months. Some big, some uh, FCA work, a little bit smaller. Um, I'll talk a little bit more in a second about Delray Full Service. Um, we anticipate that GMP, um, thanks to Leanne, will now be uh, going forward in September, and we'll um, get that move, moving uh, in October. Uh, we've also got that next round of facility renewals. Um, these are the FY21s. There's other, two other high schools um, that will come in a, in a few months a few months after that. I think it's, um, we'll see that in a second. Yeah, here we go. So um, here's, here's a lot of the activities that we've got going on. Was, um, the, the core expansion, some of our facility renewals, um, design services are moving forward. Down here at Roosevelt, Roosevelt we have um, Winbrook and Pine Grove all uh, starting up. Um, where was it? It's all on the next slide. Um, design activities. Down here, so we've got more commonly Eagles Landing and Orchard View are moving forward right now. They're going to be coming forward to you guys very shortly. Um, later on this fall, Santa Lucia's and Dwyer are also, they're part of the FY, FY21 program. So they will be moving forward. Um, they're just bigger, so they take a couple extra months. You can see the next group, the FY22s that are in there, uh, those designs have been uh, approved in previous months, and we are now moving forward on those designs. As I said, Grove Park and Malaluka 
are well into design. As a matter of fact, Grove Park, I think at the turn of the new year, we're going to be starting on the holding campus um, for, for that. Um, and Malaluka, same, same premise. Uh, Malaluka's holding campus is going to be at um, Crestwood, Crestwood Middle, Middle School. So we'll, we'll be starting that in the, um, in, the, in the winter into the spring. Um, and then as you see, design kickoffs. Um, our facility renewals, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skim over these, not because they're not important, but there's a lot of work going on and I don't wanna get bogged down in the details, but you can kinda see the, the, uh, the constant uh, ongoing efforts for our, uh, maintaining these facility renewals, keeping them on task. Spanish River there, we've got a lot of work going on there, obviously. Um, same thing on the next slide, well, Wellington uh, High School with a, with a lot of work. Here's some photos from some of the work that's ongoing. Again, this is all on board doc, so if anybody out there is uh, interested in following through, you can go back and take a peek at these. There's our Wellington press box. Okay, additions and remodels. This is where I was gonna tell you that we're gonna shorten up our program. Um, right now, the only one that I'm going to be able to present to you any information on is Plumosa School of the Arts. Um, um, as I mentioned earlier, we were op able to open yesterday three brand new schools, well, two schools and an addition. Um, Washington Elementary, wonderful opening. Addison Meisner, also incredible opening. And Plumosa School of the Arts, we built that um, addition uh, for the uh, sixth through eighth. And it's now a K-8 program. And um, this is big. This is the start of Plumosa School of the Arts being kind of a Bach of the South area. So we've uh, we, um, matriculated the sixth grade classes into this building. We're still working on some of the, the second floor and some of the performance areas. Um, but the school opened and did very well. As a matter of fact, one of the other changes we've got at Plumosa School of the Arts, for those of you who may be in the area, there's a turn lane that needs to be done as part of this project. And that is coming up in the coming months. So I would anticipate by uh, Christmas, uh, by that uh, December holiday, that we will have the turn lanes, the turn lane into that uh, completed, which will also help with the traffic flow. Um, Okay, just a sampling of um, some of the uh, summer, other summer projects that we finished up on. Um, there's a bunch of facility renewals. There's a handful of mi uh, minor projects in there. Um, the Citrus Cove core expansion um, should be open any day, I would say within the next two weeks. So that cafeteria will be in full use uh, very shortly. Um, that's, a, that's a big plus, it's a big add for that school. And what, what, what isn't there? Well, poor Angel Garcia. <laughs> Angel is our SPA who's in charge of both Addison Meisner and Washington. He's also the SPA that's in charge of uh, the newly started construction projects at O5C, the elementary in Boca, and the high school over in, um, on Lyons Road. Um, all four of those projects are Angel. So, as we were so focused on getting construction done, um, we were not able to prevent, pr provide any updated um, pictures, images of that work, because kind of focusing on getting the work done. So I promise you um, with certainty that next month, um, and probably in line with uh, 10, um, the, the videos that are created, that 10 has been doing, um, we're gonna do a little presentation on what Addison Meisner and what Washington uh, look like. So we'll do the videos from 10, as well as some of our own photos. Um, and then we will also give uh, further updates on the Triple O High School and the O5C Elementary School. So, uh, with that, if there are any questions. I've got a couple. Uh, Grove Park Temporary School, was the final decision to try to put it on the campus? No, Grove Park's um, holding school will be at the Pew Center. Wow. Um, next to H.L. Watkins, there's a, uh, the Pew Center has uh, some ball fields that are part of H.L. Watkins and some tennis courts. 
We are going to create a temporary campus for the one year for Grove Park there. Wow. Um, and at the same time, we will be creating a holding campus on the, um, I want to say it's the southwest section of Crestwood. There's a, an old area where we had uh, maintenance uh, facilities uh, back in there. We're going to turn that into a holding campus and use part of Crestwood uh, proper for the administration. So we're, we've, uh, we've worked on a plan to, uh, to be able to house Malaluka and uh, the Crestwood Holding School. The, the Holding School for Malaluka at Crestwood will also be the Holding School for Winbrook the year after. Okay. Uh, Roosevelt Full Service, any further programming determination since you're going out to RFP for architects? Well, we're going to be doing a, uh, uh, looks like a 20,000 square foot building that's uh, focused on um, architecture, engineering, technology, um, as well as renovating the gymnasium. And there's another building over there that's not in, in quite as bad a shape that we may also roll into our um, development uh, for part of the technical programs. It's a, it's a lab, it's a, a welding, it's a welding lab, or it was a welding lab. So we're looking at potentially including that in the scope to uh, ensure that uh, that program is, is uh, fully supported. But it sounds like we'll be hiring the architect and then finalizing the programming so that we may be coming back with additional services for architect that they don't know about. No, 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 no. As I said, uh, well, the reason it's not actually on the street right now is because I am, I've been working with the academic side um, and Ms. Paul, and we are making sure that we have all of the academic programs okay. aligned and planned, and I just need to make sure I have square footage to accommodate those. Okay. I'll, I'll get into an, another fine. subject where that, that uh, plays in. Um, That's in a, what I wanted to make minutes. sure of. That, yeah, we know what we're doing before we yeah, go. Well, yeah, I'm not falling into the same trap that I fell into on another project. We're going to solve that before we get there. Back to Grove Park, did we, uh, did we get Castaldi to tear everything down? Glenn, if you're on, do you, um, I, I can't remember if we ended up getting that additional Castaldi for the. There were two buildings on Grove Park that I uh, was on the selection committee and they were shown to be retained because we didn't know if Castaldi was going, to, we were going back a second time to see if we could get those and just scrape the property clean. We yeah. did, we did get them removed. Oh, good. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah. I was on the Roosevelt Full Service Center. Um, what are the plans for? Are you going to? Are they still looking at renovating the cafeteria and that band shell, that wing of the facility, where the old cafeteria used to be? It's it it kind of fronts 15th Street, the building that fronts 15th. Street. Uh, well, I, I think. Well, I, I could be wrong, and I apologize. I mm -hmm. there is a building that we are pr planning on demolishing. Right. And replacing it that with a be, new yeah, building is that the? <laughs> that's probably it. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I forgive me, I don't remember if it is the cafeteria or the the music building, or but it's on that 15th. Right. It's on okay. that side street. My final question is on Plamosa. It would seem the worst time of the year to try to put a turn lane in front of a school is when school's in session, <laughs> and that's when you're doing the turn lane. Wouldn't that really mess up traffic in front of the school? Uh. <laughs> Could uh, no, I, I in, in all honesty, uh, this is not going. We're not going into this blindly and just going to say, okay, we're going to uh, open it and do it. I, I have a sneaking suspicion that the entrance that we are putting the turn lane in is not being utilized by uh, the school for the traffic flow. Okay. That um, the only thing that I worry about, and of course I'm sure uh, administration, the, the principal is worried about, uh, Miss Reynolds, is um, there's already enough traffic on the on the main road in front of. Um, Plamosa. So if we were to put construction in there, yes, I can appreciate that being a concern. Uh, for, you know, I, I'll leave it up to the design team to, and the contractor to come up with the best way to approach this to limit the disruption. This is not happening in a vacuum. We're certainly going to use uh, the principal's insights on this. That'll limit the phone call that would then come to you. Uh, yes, look forward to those. <laughs> All right, any other questions on... Uh... Dave's report here. Okay, policy reviews. Dave, can you 
Can you please pull up the red line policy instead and go to line 121? Okay, sorry, bear with me. Line 121, please. Thank you. The last thing that Cork had requested us to do um, on this policy, we were considering adding an additional contingency use for uh, departments that are subject matter experts and help us complete the mission critical part of our job, which is making students more successful. And we wanted to uh, add this, and John suggested that we change the title as from something including the word authority to uh, something else. And John, we've, we think supporting district department is a better description of what we're trying to do. Uh, yeah, do you agree I, with that? Yeah, I agree with that. That's fine. Okay. so. If there aren't any more questions I, about... I, I, okay. I do have uh, line 218. Okay. Um, where we talk about approval based on a contract. So do we have a section in this policy that deals with not allowing contracts to be split apart so that we can approve more in terms of change orders? I thought we had that somewhere where... Um, you know, you can't split a contract apart in order to stay underneath your threshold limits. I don't know if this policy includes that language. I know that the legal checks for that when they do a change order. Uh, legal does not have to review a CCUA. Um, so okay. I really don't know the answer to the question. Okay. Um, there's one typo on line 260. It should be a capital N for necessary. Uh, yeah, all three of those lines, the capitals at the front of those. And uh, under 265, we talk about contingency money and all used unused contingency funds should be returned to the appropriate district budget. Um, this policy doesn't mention what we do a lot, and that is return contingency funds before the contract is terminated because we know certain contingency funds won't be needed, and yet the job's not done, and so we return them to contingency so we can use them for other things. This really seems to indicate that, you know, all unused contingency funds, and it doesn't really seem to, at project closeout, when you go to line 267, budget upon project closeout, but we have not always waited to project closeout to pull contingency money back into the project budget. That's correct. Uh, we do manage um, contingency. This, the project managers are, are allowed to do that, to manage their contingency to cover other expenditures. The policy should probably then state that, because right now it's saying you can't do it except at project closeout. When you go to line 267, all unused contingency funds shall be returned to the appropriate district budget upon project closeout. Okay, I understand your, your concern. So. Maybe you could just add or earlier at project closeout or earlier. Or earlier, yeah, as deemed appropriate. I can add those things. Okay, that's all I had. Anybody else have issues on dreadline copy? All right. I guess you've got your final. Okay, so I just wanted to, since we seem to be done with reviewing this policy, um, my next step is to get a full review by legal, a uh, full review by. Um, construction purchasing to make sure there are absolutely no more changes before I um, <laughs> launch this up to the executive offices for approval. Mm -hmm. And we'll keep you apprised as to the progress of all of these policies we've talked about. Okay, good. Anything else for policies? All right, we're done with policies. Leanne, you're on capital plan. And you've got 20 minutes or we need to extend our meeting. We, sh we should be done by then. Okay. Um, I'm trying to find, I thought I opened it up earlier. It's that one overview. We may need to open the other one too, but we'll start with this. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, this presentation is part of the presentation we gave to the board last week on the 11th, on, the, on, the, on October 4th. Um, we stripped out the portion on the ESSER funds that I can't speak to. We had Keith Oswald, Glenda Sheffield, give an update to the board on that. So I stripped that off. So this is just on the capital plan. And go ahead and go into next next page. So the capital plan is balanced. 
So that's this is a 10-year plan. State statute requires five years, and we do we started doing 10 years when we did the 10-year sales tax, and we've just kept that up. It's a really good planning tool, and I don't want us to go backwards, so we just keep doing it. Um, there will be slight changes between now and adoption. We are closing out the books for FY21. I think accounting finished over the weekend, so I still have some few things to tweak, but we're really close to being done, and we everybody's digging into the budget and looking for things, so there'll be slight changes between now and on ad adoption, which is in September. So we've updated everything. Um, at the end of the day, I'll tell you, there, there's not a lot of change in the capital plan. And when I say that, I cringe, because we spend a tremendous amount of time. Dave's team, IT, maintenance, we spend a tremendous amount of time basically redoing the capital plan every year. And at the end of the day, I come back and say, there's really no major changes. And I, I really do cringe when I say it, because it's a ton of work. Um, the, the big enhancements, big changes we had was, um, it's, and we'll talk about each one of these as we get into further slides. So this is a summary, a preview, um, increased funding for computers, basically moving things up a year to make it easier to make sure we have computers in place when school starts. Um, in a, lot, a big increase in funding for roof replacements, and we increase the budget for Delray full service. Um, there's a little pie chart that shows everything, um, and they gave me a little clicker, Dave, so I can do it. Um, so I'm just gonna go through each section of the capital plan. First, the construction projects. There's been no changes here. It's the same list we saw last time, except I pulled off Adult Ed and Verity that are completely done. But otherwise, it's the same list of projects you've seen before. Um, debt service, um, this, this is my favorite slide because I wanna make sure it's funded and the board has to see it every time. But it's one of the things that I wanna make sure the board sees is when we're borrowing and this doesn't work, but the, the brown bars, the tan bars is the existing debt and the blue is for the new money. Um, that's new principal and interest payments. And because our debt, really most of it expires in 2030 and 2032, um, last year and again this year, we're kind of backloading it. Normally debt is done out for 25 years. We're doing it for 15 or 16 years. So because we're compressing it, Rating agencies and investors don't have a concern that we're doing pretty much interest only for the first 10 years, and then we pay it off very quickly. So that's not a normal structure, but it's just because that's the way our debt has been set up, and everybody's very comfortable with it. So we do have four COPS issue planned over the 10-year window. That's how we're financing most of our big construction projects. Facility um, projects, this is everything other than construction. So the biggest portion is facility renewals that you see all the time on your agenda items, the sales tax projects, um, trying to catch up on our maintenance. Um, other projects, that deferred maintenance and ongoing maintenance. So that's where all the roofs fall that I talked about. The roofs, air conditioning projects. There's also site acquisition. Um, the significant change, 46 roof replacements in addition to the planned facility renewal projects over the 10 year windows. So lots and lots of roofing projects. I know Dave first came to me and wanted a lot of them in the first year and I talked him into pushing some back um, because there's no way they can get it all done. So we had to look at not only what needs to be done but how quickly can we get it done. So they're loaded in as quickly as Dave's team can get the work done. Um, security projects, um, 66 million. Um, I'll mention here this, the security projects, a lot of it's funded with sales tax. We brought all that money up. It's all available now. So the work is being done as quickly as staff can get it done. Um, we also had some security grants that came in from the state. We'll get one more this year. So that number keeps growing because we, we are getting some state money specifically related to security. School buses and other vehicles, um, we're continuing to fund those through sales tax now and it switches over to other funding sources once the sales tax, sales tax ends. Um, equipment, that's basic furniture and equipment, musical instruments, maintenance of equipment. Um, and all these numbers are over a 10 year window. So when you see it, I'd love to tell you just divide it by 10. For equipment, it, you can do that. And you could do that for buses. It doesn't work that way for security projects. It's all available all, all up front. Education technology, this is mostly funded with sales tax. It's the big interactive flat panels. Um, we have a couple of them here in this room that we're not using today, but we've got them in every classroom. Um, right, And most of this money, we're doing some break fix. We're still doing some audio enhancement work. 
Um, but we know that the plan is to replace all those flat panels again by the end of the 10 year window. So the sales tax incorporated putting them in and replacing them once with whatever the new technology is at that point. It may not be flat panels, it may be something else. For technology, we have, we put a lot of money in technology last year as we did all those Chromebooks so that every student had the one-to-one. -one. Um, we have one-to-one, -one, every student has a Chromebook or a laptop if they're in the technology programs. This year, one of the things we've run into is it's really hard to get computers right now because of the chip shortage. Same thing as impacting vehicles. It's hard to get the parts to make computers. It takes a lot longer to get them than it used to. So this year, actually in FY21, we moved up money that was set aside for 22 that was available in a reserve. We moved it up so that IT could buy the computers in FY22 so they were available on the day, first day of school. We went through the capital plan and moved the technology money up every year to make sure they have the money in place to buy the school computers during the school year that they're ready to hand out on the first day of school. We've also had to beef up some money for cyber and network security. Um, there's a whole separate technology committee that digs into that, but we do have to put some extra resources in, and that's just, that just the, the way the world is working these days. Other capital items, the property and flood insurance, the reserves, and, and that number seems really high. Part of it is reserves in those last five years because I don't know what's gonna, we don't know what's gonna be needed in the last five years. So the reserves are a lot higher in the last five years, and they're all projections. Many things could happen between now and then. So I don't get excited about having a huge number there. Again, it's over a 10 year window. And then charter schools, um, this was funded by the state for FY22. Um, it's about $11 million a year. We assume that for year two through 10, that the state's gonna renege and say we don't have enough money and that we're gonna have to do it. So when it came time to balance the budget this year, the state did fund it. That was an extra $11 million that we could use to help balance the budget. We are hoping it continues to do that. Um, we're just very conservative by nature. I would much rather come up, we're balancing the year, I've got an extra $11 million for whatever surprises come up because something always happens, extra roofing projects, increase for Delray Full Service, we need to move computers up, um, things always happen. So I'd rather be happy to have a little extra money to balance the budget than have to go back and say, oh my gosh, we've got to cut 10 million, $11 million of the work. So we always assume the state's not going to fund it and then we're very happy to have some extra money to work with. And that charter money, they have to give no reason. It's just like, hand out, give me a check. It's in statute that it, this is how much the charters are supposed to receive. And if the state is not able to fund it, then the districts have to make up the shortfall. Right, That's but for, for, for no reason. They don't have to give a reason. Like we're no. building an addition or we're adding buses. No. It's just hand out, give me a check. Thank you, the state said so. Yes. Okay, thank you. The, the charter schools do have to tell us what they're spending the money on. Oh, that's what I meant. So even when the money is, when the state is funding it, it flows through us, and we require them to tell us what they're spending the money on. And we have to verify that it's in compliance with statute. So there are reasons they have to spend the money. Yes, they're spending the money for the same thing we spend capital money for. It's for buildings. Okay. Whether building them or renting them, it could be for buying buses, technology. They have the same rules to follow that we do. Okay. okay I'm sorry, I misunderstood your yeah, question. Yeah, no, because when that first had all come out, it was just like a handout, and they didn't really have to give reasons. Right. I mean, if they have to give reasons and validate that they're rebuilding a parking lot with the money, fine. Right. You know? Leanne? Yes. Um, is that additional money that goes to charter schools, or, or has that been coming out of funds that you, the district used to have itself from the state? Has it reduced what the yes. district gets from the state? Yes, it is coming from um, PICO, which is Public Education Capital Outlay. The district used to receive PICO funds um, for maintenance and for construction. We don't receive that anymore. All that money is going either to charter schools or universities and colleges. So the state, the, the, the public schools are not getting PICO funds at this point. The money is all going to charter schools but they're not getting any of the local tax, tax money. So I count that as a win. Um, it's not ideal, but it, it's the best we've got at this point. Okay, so the concerns, um, vast majority of our tax revenue is 
dedicated to addressing deferred maintenance um, that can't be used for anything else. And we have a separate committee, ISOC, checks to make sure we're spending the money the way we promised. Um, the board can't change how we're using the sales tax revenue. So, well, I guess we could, we do it only with ISOC's approval, but um, we're, we're sticking with that original project list. Um, legislative issues that we will monitor, cost per student station calculations to see what those factors are. We just got new ones and it actually cost went up, which was surprising they've been going down. Um, so we have to constantly monitor those. DOE approval for projects, funding for charter schools, all those things can impact the capital plan as we move forward. There is a concern, additional needs for maintenance, um, whether it's staffing, services, preventive maintenance to avoid another backlog. Um, trying to keep our arms around that to make sure that we're, we're covering that. Um, one of the things I want to point out, and I, I haven't mentioned this to the board yet, and I'm gonna, I'll build that into the adopt a pr a presentation in September. We've always gone back to look, if you remember back in 2000, and I, I can't even remember the year now, but 2005, six, seven, when they had um, the Great Recession, the state reduced our taxing authority from two mills to 1.75 and now to 1.5 mills. So when you go back and look, it was in 2008, we go back to 2008 and see how much money we received for property taxes for capital purposes and compare that to where we are now. This is the first year that we've received more money than we did in 2008. This is the first year. So until this, until this year, we were receiving less money than we did in 2008. So when we talk about the backlog, why we needed the sales tax, that's exactly why we needed the sales tax. Um, but we're just now getting to the level, we just got to the level we were in 2008, and costs have gone up significantly. So as much as I'd love to say, the sales tax covered that shortfall, we're there. We're to the same level of money we were in 2008, but costs have gone up a lot. So I can't tell you for certain that we aren't gonna need another sales tax. Um, that's, that's something that everybody's, we're gonna need to work on. Dave and I talk about that on a regular basis. We need to start looking at what's the next batch of projects. And when we look at the capital plan, and I can bring this up if you like, but in the capital plan, we have a, a section that for facilities. And when you look at that, and especially if you get to this, the last five years, we're averaging about $123 million a year for maintenance. If you go back to the capital plan in FY16, which was before the sales, the year before the sales tax, we were at 50 to 60 million a year. Hmm. So we've doubled the amount of money we're spending on maintenance. That's not facility renewals, but that is roofs and air conditioning, things outside the sales tax. We've doubled that. So we have made it a concerted effort. That was one of the commitments that we made with the last sales tax to make sure that we were spending more money on maintenance so that we don't get to where we were. At the same time, costs have gone up substantially. Things don't last as long as they used to. So there, there's a whole study that will need to be done as to what happens when the sales tax is done. Do we need another one? Do we need it for technology? Do we need it for, cons for maintenance construction? And I don't know the answer to that yet, but it's something that we're starting to work on. The process of doing a referendum, and, and our referendum ends in 2026. So it's a number of years away, um, but it's never too early to look at process. The process for sales tax now requires a review from an external CPA firm that is appointed by the Biopaga out of Tallahassee. Um, so we can't just decide on our own. We have to come up with it, have a strategy, and then outside Opaga will appoint a CPA firm to come in and do an audit of our projected needs. So there, there's a bigger process to doing a sales tax now than there was in the past. So I remind Dave all the time, that we need to look at that. We're also building, when you think about the one I'm focused on, and I pick a new one every year, but um, we're replacing a lot of furniture in these schools right now. And I said, every time we replace the furniture, if we replaced furniture in 2020, we know that furniture is gonna need to replace, be replaced in 2020, 2030, assume it has a 10 year life. So we're trying to build that in the capital plan. We added a new line item specifically for furniture replacement and building that capacity so that we're ready and trying to find all those things that we need to have a schedule for. And I really do drive Dave crazy <laughs> with these things. Um, we need to add them in the capital plan. Even if we get to the point where we can't fund them, we need to be building that list so we know what the needs are in the future. So we're definitely keeping all that in mind and trying to build that database. And furniture's a challenge just because 
We're not replacing every single piece of furniture in a school right now because that would mean we'd throw out half of the furniture is probably still in good working condition. So we get money now. Yeah, that furniture needs to be replaced in 2030, but there's some other group that's going to be need to need to be replaced in a few years. So it's a constant, ever-evolving process. Yeah. So, so we do have a funding strip in there that uh, Ms. Powell controls specifically to manage that process, and, and we're building that data um, to try to stay on top of it. Um, the, last bu the last bullet I have here is rising construction costs, and that's something we're certainly monitoring. And then I just open it up for discussion. If you'd like me to bring up the capital plan, we can. I've got it as an attachment. Generally, the presentation seems to work for all of yeah. you. We don't like to get too deep in the weeds. Virginia. I'm wondering if you're considering electric vehicles, electric buses, and whether you're putting electric charging stations. We actually received a grant, and we will be getting some electric school buses. And the new transportation complexes um, are going to have charging stations in for the buses. And I, I've told them over and over again while we're planning them, run the conduit, even if we only have one right now. But once you've got the conduit in, it's an easy thing and you're not ripping up. This is when I pretend I know something about construction. Um, it's easier to do <laughs> She's very advance. good. She really is. Um, build it in advance. I know they're putting that into the specs. Okay. And one other question. Uh, you don't have to pull it up. It's on page six of the full plan. There, there's an item <laughs> called uh, other facility projects media centers that's getting one thousand two hundred fifty dollars and i'm wondering what on earth well, you we can't even buy one book per we library haven't closed the project out yet that's projects that were done and we didn't get the final bill in so it shows up oh, and you see okay. me look at him <laughs> because i wished it was done but it's the la we're waiting for the last bill so it has to show up this has to tie out to the budget okay so, we so, so there's no plan in in the 10 years out to no, do anything more those, those really small ones those three there's the galaxy wind turbine that has been done and this is money that actually part of it goes back to the city of boynton beach and part of it goes back to the education foundation we just didn't get that done before the end of the year. Um, the Jupiter High School, that is for the Perry Cohen tribute that was done at that high school, and that money is going back to their foundation. And then for the media centers, we're waiting for the final bill to come in. <coughs> One bill. Okay. All right. And I understand that it's um, in the works. It's, it, we should have it done. So if a media center needs technology upgrades, it doesn't come here, it comes under the technology there's actually under equipment, there's a section there for AV media. Okay. And they get money every year to buy um, equipment for libraries. All right, thank you. Those were my questions. Uh, we got three minutes to uh, have questions on, anybody have questions on the minutes? No issues on minutes, so they are accepted. Anything specific that we haven't already told staff that we'd like to be presented at the next meeting? Hearing nothing extra, then uh, if anybody has anything, you can email Susan or Dave or Jim when you want something to be brought up. Anything else by anyone? All right, we are adjourned. Thank you.